Trucks could impose a small uh, tax on your car being dirty when it comes in for inspection, and other towns could impose a big tax. So depending on where you live and where you drive, you might have to pay a different tax. Um, so uh, French, uh, the French government does a lot of taxing of pollution. So all power plants and all polluters have to pay a whole range of different taxes for each of the different categories of pollution that they admit. And these are based on calculations of what the harms caused by those are. And they're measured directly from the smokestacks. They put filters over there that catch what the emissions are. Carbon taxes are another example of this. We'll talk a lot about this on Thursday. These are particularly used in Europe, but they've been proposed in the United States for the United States and the world. Now, most economists prefer this type of taxation over direct regulations, which are an alternative way to deal with pollution. So, uh, sometimes countries just say, you can't pollute more than this, you can't pollute more than that, and so forth, different factors. And uh, Themistocles, uh, why, um, or you go by Them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, why do economists tend to prefer externality taxes over direct regulation? Uh, because, like, with externality taxes, you can, like, firms can adjust their production yeah. quantities to reach a more, like, like, the most efficient amount possible. Yeah, so give me an example of that. Uh, like, imagine that there were two factories, what might happen? Yeah, under the government scheme versus under the, the tax scheme. Well, under the tax scheme, like they could figure out a way so that the factory that is able to produce less than the other one yeah. could somehow get paid by the other one. Yeah, I mean, that's basically what the tax would do, right? Yeah. It would make the one that it can most easily reduce the pollution, reduce it a lot. And the one where it's really hard to reduce it wouldn't reduce it that much, yeah. right? Um, so uh, Mar Margaret Fowley uh, and co-authors showed that if you replace the current regulations in the United States of uh, and NOx, which is uh, nitrogen oxide, um, with a tax system, basically what would happen is, so there are these big factories that have spent a huge amount of money reducing their <coughs> NOx output. And then there's cars where, <coughs> where for an incredibly cheap amount of money, you could reduce their output. And so if you had a tax, all the cars would get the NOx filter to avoid the tax. And all of the factories would be uh, producing more of it, and that would be much more efficient. But for political reasons, because they don't want to make the drivers pay more, uh, they've imposed these standards, and it's much less efficient. And they calculated that you could save $2 billion for the country if you imposed a tax rather than having these regulations on the factories and leaving the cars unregulated. Um, okay. Now, in the United States, most, many, if not most, Peguvian taxes are imposed through the legal system. So when a firm or an individual causes harm, they get sued by the person who they caused the harm to, and the court has to assess how much harm was caused. Um, and they usually have to pay a few different types of damages. So the first one are called compensatory damages, and these directly redress the harm that was caused. But sometimes they're also forced to pay punitive damages. And the reason why they pay these, and those don't get paid to the person who sues necessarily, they can sometimes get paid to the government. And they have to pay these because not every time someone causes harm, it makes sense to bring a lawsuit, right? So to deter the activity, you need to like sort of multiply the um, amount they pay by one over the probability that they get detected and, and sued for the bad behavior. Because otherwise, there won't be enough to turn. Um, they may also uh, have to deal uh, with, they may also deal with the fact that the plaintiff might have been sort of reckless in getting into the plane with the drunk guy, for example. Uh, <coughs> and therefore, they don't want to like fully pay the money to the plaintiff, because that would encourage them to do reckless things that would cause other people to be causing externalities to them. Uh, and uh, that causes some of the money to be paid to the government rather than to the plaintiff. And you'll have more on this in your wonderful new problem set. Uh, 
Um, so if the Anglo-Saxon system of, uh, of civil justice basically incorporates Bagu's principle almost directly into it. Um, and the basic reason it does this, and this is the idea behind the common law, is it's just too hard to write laws and, and charge taxes for every externality that occurs. There's just too many externalities that occur, and the legal system tries to deal with those flexibly uh, using the common law system. Now, in Europe, um, they have a far more uh, regulatory system. They have much less litigation, and the government makes laws about many, many more things. And that reflects the fact that they're much less sympathetic than the U.S. is to the sort of market-oriented payments in accordance with product principle. So while people on the right in the United States are often very upset about like frivolous litigation, in some sense the litigation system in the United States is exactly a reflection that we believe more in market-oriented principles and making people pay their harms rather than having the government come in and directly regulate and stop people from doing harmful activities. Um, often, uh, these things are not paid directly by people going to court, but someone will bring a case, the other person will realize they have a strong case, and there will be a settlement or a negotiation about what the harm was. Okay. So, um, in Europe, on the other hand, uh, there's more direct control of behavior. But the truth is, even in the U.S. system, uh, there's a bit of a spectrum. Because, um, you know, the strictest form of uh, liability is what's called uh, strict liability. And that would just make you pay for all the harms that you cause to people, for anything that goes wrong that's even vaguely a result of your action. And that would be a really crazy system, as I'll try to illustrate in a moment. Um, instead, what usually happens is that there's certain actions that you are thought to be negligent if you don't take, that are sort of reasonable precautions that you take not to harm people, and if you don't do one of those, then you can be sued. Whereas if something bad just happens sort of through no fault of your own, in some sense, you're not forced to do this. And in some sense, that acts more as a direct regulation on action and less as a payment on the consequences of your action. So in reality, there's much more of a spectrum. Depending on how much the system is based on negligence and how much it's based on strict liability, that'll determine how much you're close to Pigou and how much you're close to the European system of direct regulation. Um, so uh, the problem is that otherwise there would be too many lawsuits and too much risk. And one of the most classic examples of this um, is a very famous Supreme Court case. So there was this guy getting on to a train who had a very heavy box that he was carrying with him. And the train conductor, uh, and the steward on the train picked up the box and helped him onto the train with it, but in the process, he sort of tripped. The box fell down. Turns out it was filled with fireworks. The fireworks exploded. The train exploded. And, like, tons of people died. Um, and so all these people brought a class action lawsuit against the steward on the train who helped the guy with the box into the car. Uh, and the problem is, it's like, what was this guy supposed to do, right? It's like, you not help someone with their box. How were they supposed to know that there was a bunch of fireworks in, in the box? And that, you know, I mean, it was just a completely crazy situation, right? So if you were, like, letting people bring lawsuits for that stuff, the whole system would be totally clogged. It has to be based more on a principle of what was the due care that this person had a responsibility to take. A classic example of this is medical malpractice. You can't just bring a lawsuit against your doctor just because, um, uh, not, uh, you can't just bring a lawsuit against your doctor just because you ended up not getting better, right? It has to be based on him not doing a good job in some way. Um, and uh, the way that we usually solve this problem is not just through the negligence rule in the United States, but that even if the doctors have to pay a large fraction of the harms they cause on, to, on their patients, they get medical malpractice insurance. And once they have that insurance, the insurers monitor them to make sure they're not being too irresponsible, rather than just making them pay the consequences of everything that they did. Okay. And, um, and the interesting thing about this, I think, 
is that even though the system is a little bit closer in the United States to making you just pay for the consequences of your action, as soon as someone gets medical malpractice insurance, they're not really bearing all the consequences. It's what, acting more like a regulated system. So even though that comes about through the private sector, in many ways it replicates the more European system of direct regulation of actions. Okay, so instead um, of mandating the price for an externality, you can mandate the total quantity of the activity and then allow people to trade those permits uh, for the right to do it. Any vet? Is it vet? No. Uh, does anyone else want to explain wh why that's equivalent? Okay, I'll, I'll do it. So, if you put a maximum on pollution and then auction off the right to pollute, um, or a minimum and auction off the right not to do the thing, uh, then that allows people to trade the right to pollute, right? And people will bid in this auction, and whatever the clearing price in the auction is will be equivalent to a tax, right? Because that's what you have to pay in order to get the right to pollute. And the most efficient people at reducing the activity will be the ones who are uh, willing to pay the least for the right to pollute, <coughs> The ones who are let least efficient will pay the most, and it will act exactly like the, uh, the tax, right? So for many intents and purposes, this is exactly equivalent. Um, and this is particularly obvious in the case of an auction, but instead, often for political reasons, uh, governments prefer to give out the credits rather than to auction them off. And the reason is, this is a way to basically buy off the political support of the people who are hurt by the imposition of the tax, like companies that use a lot of energy, right? <coughs> if you give them the credits in order to sort of buy them off, because those credits will have some value in the market. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Um, with this sort of situation to cap the total pollution, like say you're a government, you said, you know, I only want this much pollution. Yeah. So then, in that sense, it might be different than the tax system. Because in taxing, you kind of can't don't really know how much pollution there's going to be exactly. That's the next slide. So we're going to talk more about that. But imagine that you know exactly what the demand curve is yeah. and the supply curve is. You then they're completely equivalent because the quantity <laughs> just corresponds to some price. But if you're uncertain, you're absolutely right. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next slide. Um, so the, it's, it's, you could do this with taxes, right? You could impose a tax, and then you could just give money to all the people that were hurt. hurt. But that looks like a blatant giveaway to, like, big companies, whereas if you give them the credits, even though that's exactly the same thing, because those credits are worth money, somehow it looks better, right? And so people do this largely as a way to cover up the fact that they're giving money away to various companies. Um, now, putting aside this, I want to talk about the pure economic logic for each of these two systems, which follows exactly what Mike was just suggesting. And the basic problem is, um, do you want, is that the, once you set a price or a quantity, you're sort of stuck with that price or quantity for a while, and the demand may change, or you might not know exactly what the demand is. And when there's that uncertainty, prices versus quantities uh, could really be different from one another. So imagine that you um, have some just marginal externality that will always be the marginal externality that uh, is caused regardless of how much of the activity is done. Then it makes a lot of sense to use a tax. Because if people want to do more of it, they'll do more of it. If you want to do less of it, they'll do less of it, and they'll bear the cost. Uh, and this, this is the case when the marginal cost of the uh, activity to society is extremely elastic. If it's extremely elastic, then you're going to want to just impose a tax. Um, or if the marginal cost of mitigation, um, the marginal cost of doing less of the activity is extremely steep, then you're also going to want to have a tax, right? Because if the marginal cost of mitigation is extremely steep and you choose the wrong quantity, that's going to impose huge costs on the private sector, right? So if the, um, cost, if the externality is uh, elastic and the benefit to the private sector is inelastic, you want to use a tax. Um, an example of this might 